they call this series the dark side of the ring for a reason and the most recent episode of the dark side of the ring lives up to its moniker before watching this episode i knew how i knew this was going to be a dark episode but after watching it and marinating on it for two days it was more disturbing than i would have thought and uh, let's just jump into this review uh what's up guys it's your boy dick uh we're gonna just jump into the review on uh the dark side of the ring series uh this one on the smith family in particular grizzly smith when the when the episode first starts we get a quote from jake roberts and he his quote is you know how hard it is to put a smell on your face when you know what a piece of shit you really are that to me set the tone of the episode um, and that also describes jake's life and that how he thought very little of himself and we kind of get we kind of see how he became who he was as a person soon we're introduced to the rest of the family uh jake's real name is arulian smith jr uh his brother michael who wrestled under the name sam houston he also wrestled, uh, sam houston was a wrestler in the in the wb during the mid to late 80s and uh robin who wrestled as rock and robin during the same time frame we also get introduced to another brother richard who did not become a wrestler and his his reasoning behind it was he hated to travel and uh these four are going to tell the story of their family and uh to me, the one that stuck out the most was not so much Jake, but Robin. Robin, her, the, the way that she told these stories and the fact that she was pretty consistent in, in other interviews. Uh, she did a High Spots interview and uh, she made the same accusations there. And uh, there were a couple books that said the same thing. So to me, the person that really stuck out the most was Robin and not so much Jake. So uh, Jake tells a story about how he first got into the business and he claimed that his father would try to get him, fi would get him fired in whatever promotion he was working at uh, as a way to get him out of the business. Jake did not like that and to him, in his mind, that made him want to succeed more to spite his father. Now, how did Grizzly get into the business? Uh, Grizzly was a big dude. Uh, Grizzly, uh, by the way, his real name is Aurelian Smith Sr. So you see the, the connection between Grizzly and Jake. Aurelian Smith Sr., Aurelian Smith Jr. Jake, by the way, did not like to be called Jr. He hated, he hated that name. But going back to Grizzly, uh, he was a big dude, 6 feet, 10 inches, 350 pounds. Uh, and that caught the eye of a lot of promoters in uh, in Texas. So uh, that's how he got his start into the wrestling business. And Jake would recall a story of how Jake and Richard, I should say, they both uh, would tell. They would recall stories of how his father would get involved in in various angles, and he would sell injuries at home. And that kind of trauma and that traumatized the kids because they felt that if their father was going to die in the ring but little did they realize that the father was working them and in, in jake's mind at the time he harbored resentment towards that because he felt his father was not being honest and uh that's going to be the theme throughout this episode was uh the fact that grizzly apparently led a double life in in more ways than one yeah uh in the eyes of the public and the wrestling public, he was perceived as a nice guy. However, behind closed doors, it was a completely different uh, person. The uh, producers interviewed Baby Doll. Baby Doll was a valet working for uh, the Jim Croc for Jim Crockett Promotions back in the in the eighties. So she was a valet for Dusty Rhodes and Tully Blanchard. Her connection to the family was that she was married to Sam Houston. And she told the story about her and Grizzly going on a road trip. Uh, I forgot where uh, they didn't name the destination, but they were going somewhere. And they had to make a detour, a 50 mile detour to pick up a 14 year old girl. And she just thought that was strange that this girl was riding around with 
them for a couple days. Uh, the parents had waved her off, and they 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 go and join them. And she always thought that was so weird. And uh, and then, which follows up with uh, Jim Cornette being interviewed, and uh, Cornette was telling him when he was working for Mid South at the time. Now, when he was there at Mid South, uh, Grizzly Smith was a road agent, and he would tell stories about how uh, the boys would say jokes about oh grizzly's going grizzly's going to be grooming these young girls and and cornet just thought it was a joke uh but little did he realize that that was actually happening um i'm gonna i'm gonna defend cornet on this one because he thought it was a joke and i know people were starting to to shit on cornet because oh you knew about this you knew about this but yeah you did nothing you you enabled him you encouraged it to happen it wasn't so much as him encouraging as the fact that he didn't know the, when you joke about stuff like that yeah there's truth to it but there's no evidence there, there there wasn't concrete evidence that it was happening because of the image that grizzly gave to the public that he was he was a nice guy um that's how many people saw him in the business uh relatable but in the private life he was a completely different person so i just want to say that about jim i, th I think he kind of got unfairly criticized and then we get to a commercial break we come back and um jake tells us the difference between Jake and Aurelian, and that Aurelian was a, I mean, I'm sorry, Jake was a mean SOB who had no boundaries, whereas Aurelian was a 13 year old crippled child and hasn't grown up in, and so, in fact, he hasn't seen Aurelian in 30 to 40 years. Uh, tells that Jake is, you know, a fine individual as long as he's, as he's handcuffed. And from what we've seen throughout the years, uh, when Jake Roberts is not handcuffed, destruction follows. And uh, Jake also tells a story about how he became, how he got the name uh, the Snake. And he was uh, listening to a Monday Night Football game. Uh, it was an Oakland Raider game, I should say. Not, and it may not, it may not have been on Monday night, but it was a Raider game where uh, there was a quarterback by the name of Ken Stabler, and his nickname was the Snake. And Jake thought that was such a cool name because he was under the influence. He was uh, completely fucked up and just said, you know what, I'm going to use that name. And, uh, he, and Jake ran the snake and the rest was history. And a uh, real interesting um, note is that Jake does not like snakes. So uh, that's another thing to take into consideration. And uh, Jake also tells a story about his mom. And this is where things are like really like they get really bad. And, and uh, again, this is Jake, but we have to tell the story. And he tells a story about his mother. He loved his mom. And uh, he told the story of how he was conceived. His mom was 13 years, 13 years old when she gave birth to him. And she tell he tells a story about how uh, his father dated Jake's grandmother at the time, and Jake's father ended up raping uh, his grandmother's daughter, and she she gave birth to Jake nine months later. So, yeah, that's a uh, that's some pretty disgusting shit right there, and. Uh, yeah, man, it's a uh, oof. So a few years later, after uh, Jake uh, Jake was born, uh, Grizzly divorced his mother, and that's when the rest of the children were split up, and they kind of went their separate ways. Um, Jake ended up going with his grandma. Uh, Jake loved his grandma. Uh, Jake had a, a tremendous relationship with her. He thought very highly of her. Unfortunately. Uh, his grandmother dies by the time he turns 11. So Jake has to go back uh, to live with his father. And uh, he, he ended up with a, he has a new woman on the side. Uh, that woman was uh, Robin and Michael's mother. Uh, now Jake tells a story where uh, 
his stepmom would uh, take advantage of him. And uh, Jake, Jake, Jake claims that his uh, stepmother raped him and would beat him with a clothesline after to kind of punish him for being a bad person. Uh, that's some pretty disgusting shit right there. Again, like, uh, this is going to get pretty bad. Like, uh, when you hear these stories, it's, you think this is bad, it's just going to get worse. So, um, I'm just throwing it out there. Uh, Robin would, would then come in the story, and uh, Robin uh, would call her father a monster. And this is where we're really going to, this is really where things get really fucked up. So, Robin tells a story about when she was eight years old and her father took advantage of her. And in Robin's words, he worked her. Uh, as I mentioned, and as I mentioned, uh, the Robin story does add up because she has been pretty consistent about the accusations in various interviews. Um, she did a high spots interview uh, several years ago where she made the accusations and um, there were a couple of books that were released in which she made the same accusations as well. So I, I think her story is pretty, pretty sound. Uh, she does say that she was not aware of her mom raping Jake, but she doesn't dismiss the claim as she's certain that her father probably encouraged it to happen. And then we get into another sibling, uh, Jo Lynn. Uh, jo Lynn uh, was she died young. She was about, she died when she was 20. Uh, she also tells us, Robin also tells a story about uh, JoLynn getting raped by her father. And uh, Robin did eventually tell her mom about what happened. And that drove her to leave Grizzly. Now, if we, go, we, uh, we go a few years later where Robin tells a story of when she was a teenager, she would be hanging out with uh, Joe Lynn. And when they were hanging out, they were kind of asking, Robin was asking her questions about Grizzly. And from the answers that she got from Joe Lynn, it confirmed that Grizzly did the same thing to her that happened to Robin. Two weeks later, after they hung out, Joe Lynn was kidnapped. And then we get into the whole story about uh, JoLynn being kidnapped. She thought that it was strange that there was a note left by her father saying that she was kidnapped. Uh, Richard was pissed about it. Uh, Richard was very close to JoLynn. Like, they were, they were very close to each other. So when he found out about it, he was furious. And he began, he began to uh, break stuff. He punched a hole in the wall. Um, then we get to the story of... Uh, who at the time was the police chief in the town that, that, that in which the crime scene occurred, uh, Carl Buzz Gage. He tells a story of when he reported the crime scene, uh, he believed that the evidence pointed out to Joe Lynn's husband, ex-wife. Uh, he believed that she was the one that, that masterminded this whole kidnapping process because she was jealous that she left her, that he left her for Joe Lynn. Uh, unfortunately, after the investigation, they were never able to find the body and uh, the person that or the um, the ex-wife ended up being charged with and was found guilty of the crime. Richard tells a story of how Grizzly was in the courtroom and that he had a uh, a clothesline hooked with two hooks. And that he was going to try to find some way to go behind her in the courtroom and strangle her to death as revenge. Of course, you know, Grizzly's a big dude, 6'10", 300 plus pounds. It is, it's impossible for someone that big to sneak behind someone in a, court, in a courtroom to try to strangle them to death. And I'm sure if he got his hands on her, he, she would have been dead. Like, there was just no way that she was going to survive. So. As I mentioned, they weren't and they were unable to find the body. Uh, they believed that she was incinerated. Like after they killed her, they burned the body to get rid of the evidence. And uh, Richard, you know, he wanted to find some closure into this, so he uh, proposed to his father that to go on unsolved mysteries to find out what actually happened. Uh, but Grizzly refused, and in the family's eyes, they believed that Grizzly had 
was involved in some capacity. Uh, now, later it turns out that that wasn't the case. And the reason why that Grizzly didn't want to do that was maybe just to protect and, and, and to protect his, his family. Now, that was uh, the claim by others when they saw it from their perspective. So you think this is you think it's dark now? It's just it's I'm telling you, it's going to get a lot worse. So just, uh, you know, if for those that are still with us, just hang in there. Um, and then we come back and Jake again tells the story of his hatred and his hatred and resentment towards his father. Um, he didn't understand really like the success of the Jake the Snake character. Uh, he didn't really understand it. Back then, Jake was a huge, he was a huge draw. I mean, he was probably one of the top three faces at one point, one, one of the top three names in the WWE during the mid to late 80s and even into the early 90s. Uh, there was a story where uh, Jake was going to be in a feud with Hulk Hogan, and uh, there were some house show matches, and Jake would lay out Hogan with the DDT, but instead of the crowd booing, the crowd cheered. And that footage has never been shown, has never been, been shown. Um, that's something if the WWE still has, they should release it, because that's a... That's a hidden. That's a hidden. That's a hidden. That's a hidden gem, and that just goes to show you that during that time, that Hogan was running wild. This was peak Hogan. We're talking about. I mean, peak Hogan was from eighty-five to you could say nineteen ninety, um, and during that run, Hogan was the man. And we tend to think that you know Hogan started getting booze probably as early as probably as early as ninety-one, ninety-two. Um, I probably remember as early as I would say as early as not including the Ultimate Warrior match that happened at WrestleMania six. I would say as early as ninety one uh, when he was feuding with the Undertaker. But then you hear about these reports about him and Jake working together, you know, doing these tours, and Jake was getting cheered. That just goes to show you how popular Jake Roberts was at the time. So he he definitely was one was one of the biggest names of in the WWE at that at that time so then uh robin explains how she got into the business uh she wanted to become a professional wrestler and uh, when she was trained she was trained in the same manner as the men as the men and she wanted to make women's wrestling as impactful as uh the men uh that eventually got Vince McMahon's attention and was and was impressed by her work and that's how really all four of them were working at around that time uh Rock and Robin did win the WWF Women's Champion by beating Sherry Martell, um, another another wrestler who I think was criminally underrated and to me did have significant impact on on the wrestling business. So we go to Cornette. Uh, Cornette talks about how out of all of everyone in the family, Jake was the mastermind. Jake was you know had the ring psychology because he didn't have the body for it. But as far as in ring ability, he praised uh, he praised Michael the most, uh, Sam. The only problem is that Sam was such a small dude. He was a, a tall, lanky guy, and back in the eighties, that was going to get you nowhere. The eighties were, you know, you had to be a big dude. You had to be a, a muscle freak, uh, six feet four, three hundred pounds, in order to even be relevant at that at that time. Uh, had Michael come in a different era maybe in the in the 90s he probably could have had some success so we go back to baby doll um and baby doll tells a story about how um michael was trying to go to her father to talk to him about the marriage proposal and that he was so nervous that he drank 32 crowning cokes before going up to her father and asking her father to marry her. And uh, Michael did have a penchant for alcohol. Um, so did Robin. And so did, and in fact, the whole family did have substance abuse problems, especially Jake. Jake, Jake was no stranger. Uh, that's, that's not, that's no secret about Jake Roberts, but um, man, 32 crown and Cokes. I don't know how he was still standing. That's a, uh, you you got to be you got to have some sort of tolerance some inhumane level of tolerance 
And Baby Doll knew this was a problem. She knew that uh, she knew about um, Michael's Michael's addiction to alcohol, but she naively believed that if she loved him enough, that it would change her. It would change him for the better. Unfortunately, that did not end up be the case as they ended up being divorced uh, several years later. Now we go back to Robin. Robin believes the family does have an addictive personality. And um, as I mentioned, if you've seen Jake, uh, there's that's a no, that's a no-brainer. And uh, I'm sure, and I'm sure that it was because of the trauma that they all had to endure as a kid. Uh, when you're traumatized as a child, you're gonna try to find something to uh, to drown it out. Whether it's whether it's drugs, alcohol, whatever the case is, so uh, that statement is true. I think that 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 what she said is one hundred percent correct. This to me, this part of the story of the series to me was really the most disturbing one. Uh, you know, I thought it was bad when um, Robin told the story about her father raping the the kids, and, and you think that's bad, Robin tells a story about her father would show up to her house one day and uh, his her father brought a nine-year-old girl complete stranger not no one that she knew brought her over and the first thing that uh, Grizzly asked her is to make her a daiquiri as she never had a daiquiri what the fuck so Robin says, no, I don't have anything to make it with. And she's uh, she's very concerned. She's like, no, no, I'm 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 not doing this. And the fact that you sh that her that her father, an older man, shows up with a nine year old girl, that was that was fucking disgusting. So as they were leaving, uh, thankfully, Robin keeps the girl there at her house. Grizzly does not leave her without her. Um, she, she tells her father, you can go, but she's staying. And, uh, that to me took a lot of courage to say that, um, just my God, dude, like, and yeah, in case you didn't realize, uh, Grizzly Smith was a fucking pedophile. So, uh, Jesus Christ, dude. So, uh, we go back to, uh, Commercial, we'll go back to from commercial, and uh, we hear Sam's story. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, Sam has had a penchant for alcohol, and uh, he's had to the point where he's had so many DUIs. Uh, he claims he holds the record for the amount of DUIs in the state of Texas, but yet he would always find he would always be off the hook. And he claims it was due to his father's connections that he was able to receive a light sentence until his father was no longer able to help him out and mad had found out about his uh driving record so they um they were able to pressure the local authorities into arresting him and actually having him serve jail time so as he gets to jail about uh, the second day in sam tells a story as he tried to hang himself because he just he didn't know what to expect. He he thought like he had rock bottom. And the only way out was to hang my to hang himself. Fortunately for him, that did not happen. He was unable to 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 kill himself, but he did suffer some. He did suffer um, so he did suffer a leg injury as a result. Um, which is still a lot better than suicide. Then we get back to Jim Cornette. Jim Cornette tells, uh, makes a pretty damning analogy uh, with Jake Roberts and how he compares Jake to Keith Richards in that they both cannot die, uh, especially with Jake. A lot of people thought that Jake was going to OD by the time he was in his 40s, and uh, I thought so too, you know, especially, uh, especially during the, the mid to late 90s where Jake definitely hit rock bottom, and they do bring up the infamous heroes of wrestling pay-per-view which was the worst pay-per-view of all time if you have never seen or heard about this pay-per-view don't watch it it's such a train wreck it is so bad and this is where we see jake roberts at his absolute worst he was under the influence of various amounts of drugs i i mean not just alcohol i'm sure cocaine 
and other types of drugs he was under the influence he, he was in no condition to wrestle the fact that he, the promoters even allowed him to wrestle is fucking disgusting jake was out there he had the snake in his he had the snake and he was making phallic gestures with the snake you could tell he should not have been out there and yes this was the same pay-per-view that gave the infamous you want to play 21 well i got 22 that's the exact same one by the way, um, I, I, I'm sure we, I'm sure we should talk to the guys. I want to talk to the guys about the, about that uh, Heroes of Wrestling pay per view. and Maybe get a list of the worst pay per views of all time. So, um, as I mentioned, Sam had a, had an alcohol problem. Jake had a terrible drug problem. Uh, Jake. Jake's favorite drug was cocaine. You know, he loved, he loved cocaine. He said he would do anything to get a fix. That's how you know you're a fiend is when you'll do anything. And, and Robin, after she left the business, she did succumb to alcohol addiction as well. So that again ties in with uh, addiction and trauma. And uh, I'm not a psychiatrist, so I can't really say that's 100% for sure. But to me, it, from an un, from an uneducated perspective, I think there is some correlation between the two. And then we get back to one last commercial break, and uh, Richard tells a story about uh, Grizzly Grizzly's last days. Grizzly did die in 2010 from complications due to Alzheimer's disease. Uh, Richard was the only caretaker for him, so basically, Richard was there. The same guy who never entered the wrestling business, who, by the way, was given up for adoption. I, I forgot to mention that earlier. Richard was given up for adoption to another family. But he still made time to connect with his other siblings. Um, he was very close to Joe Lynn. He came back and was there for his father in his last days, despite knowing the sh disgusting shit that he did to his siblings and to other people to to others um I, you know i i feel for richard i really do um he wanted to do the right thing and uh he tried to be there for everyone even though his father fucked him over his father basically threw, gave him up for adoption but yet he was there for him on his last day i mean i commend richard for that and that's another re there's another positive aspect is when you hear his story, there is some good that comes out of it. Um, by no means this was a terrible episode. It was just the subject matter was just so dark. Like you, it would be, it would be in poor taste to say this was a good episode given the subject matter. Um, but there is some light at the end and, uh, we get into the beyond the mat. I mean, uh, uh, and beyond the mat even did hint at the strained relationship between Jake and his father. Uh, the kids believed that Grizzly could do no wrong, and uh, Grizzly never really apologized for what he did. I mean, that's what Robin thought of at the time. Robin thought of um, Michael would tell how he looked up to his father and thought that he was Superman, and he couldn't fathom. Uh, the shit that he put his sisters through. Uh, Baby Doll does believe that Grizzly would brainwash Michael into believing that it was the kid's fault. Wow. That's how you know you're a fucking monster. By convincing others, well, it's not my fault that I did it. They deserved it. That's, that's fucked up. My God. As I mentioned with Richard, um, you know, Richard believes that he was the lucky one, and I believe him. Uh, he he happens to be the one that it was least damaged of, out of all the siblings. Uh, the fact for the sole fact that he he was given up for adoption, he got away from a lot of that, but yet still found some way to keep connected to uh, to the other siblings, and he didn't have to go down that dark road that professional wrestlers had to go through during the uh during the late 80s and 
early 90s. So yeah, I would agree with that statement that he was 100% lucky and, um, you know, good for him. Uh, we see Jake really in a happier place in his life. Uh, you know, Jake had struggled for years. You know, the years of drinking, the years of the drug use, especially the cocaine use. Um, even in Beyond the Mat, I mean, there was a scene where Jake was trying to get, um, was trying to score some crack from his dealer. And and unsurprisingly, Jake had a crack addiction. Uh, most recently, you know, um, it got to the point where uh, DDP had to get him into his house to get him clean and sober. Now, DDP is not a, um, he's not a, he's not a psychiatrist. He's not a, a rehab specialist. You know, he, he did it because he didn't want to see Jake going down this road. And thank God for DDP. He was able to find some way to get Jake clean and sober. Um, I did watch the resurrection of Jake, uh, Jake Roberts a long time ago. Uh, Another another good documentary shows you the struggles that Jake had to go through in order to get himself clean. And Jake has been clean for um, a good part of the past 10 years. He seems to be in a, in a much healthier place. And in fact, a lot of the kid, a lot of the Smith kids are in, in a better place now. Thank God. You know, uh, Jake's, you know, obviously working for AEW. He seems to really enjoy enjoy life. And. Uh, the documentary and the episode ends with a um, a number for it, it ends on a positive note. I should say. Let me let me let me say it ends with a positive note, especially with Jake saying that if you if you've encountered any type of trauma, get help. And it's still stigmatized to this day. You know, um, it's really hard to open up and tell others. You know what they're going through. Uh, you might get accusations of oh you're lying or you're gaslighting me or you know stuff like that and, and it really is tough um to go out and get help especially for, for for those that have encountered past trauma and uh you know there, there there are networks out there primarily rain uh the rape and rape abuse and incest network um they're up there uh go to ring.org uh they advertise it toward the end so I thought that was really good that it ended on a positive note, given that the entire episode was very dark and it was very disturbing. Uh, next week is going to be Dynamite Kid, which is it's it's going to be dark, but it's not going to be as disturbing as this one was. Hopefully not. Um, I, I could be wrong. Maybe there's a lot of stuff about Dynamite Kid that I'm not aware of. and. I might have the same feeling, but um, but absolutely, the the Grizzly Smith episode was by far the darkest episode of Dark Side of the Ring. Um, so if you haven't watched it, just again, fair warning. Go in there, you know, don't, you're gonna go in there with a lot of stuff that is gonna be very disturbing. It's a very, it's very sensitive subject matter for for everyone involved. Um. That's pretty much it right there. I got nothing else to say. I kind of rambled off for about a good 30 plus minutes. If you've lasted for with me this entire time, thank you guys. Um, we're gonna, like I said, this is gonna be a weekly thing for as long as uh this season of Dark Side of the Ring is on. I'm gonna be doing this. And hopefully um next week when I come back, it, it won't be as somber as this. Hopefully, you know, it, it won't be as heavy hearted as this episode. So um until then. Later on, guys, I'll talk to you guys uh, next week. By the way, uh, the most recent episode has dropped, so when you get a chance, please uh, please watch it. Uh, please listen to it. Uh, we, we talk about the um, – we really go into detail about the uh, releases by WWE this past Wednesday. Uh, Byron, myself, and Andrew give our thoughts on it, as well as our thoughts on, uh, on Double or Nothing. So if you haven't had the chance to check out the most recent episode, please do. Uh, it's up. It should be up on all uh, podcast platforms. And uh, like I said, until then, I'll, I'll see you guys next week. Peace.